Hi everyone, I'm Tony Keane, I'm a lecturer at the UCD School of Chemistry and in this talk we're just going to have a quick look at a couple of aspects from our, two of our courses, Introductory Transition Metal Chemistry and Main Group Structure and Bonding. And this is a talk about rocketry. So, what's the biggest chemical reaction you can think of? Most of the stuff that we do in the laboratory, we make maybe milligrams, up to maybe a whole gram or two in a day. Most of our reactions are pretty small scale. Now, if you work in the pharmaceutical industry, on the other hand, and a lot of our graduates do, then you can be making sort of 10 to 100 kilos of different drug molecules each day. So that's another step up in scale. Now, then, if you go off to work in a petrol refinery, um, then you can be looking at 40,000 tonnes a day of petrochemical products coming out from refinement. So as well as tonnes a day, we can now look at this in terms of tonnes a second. So it's half a tonne of product per second. Now this is across an enormous facility, but that's still a pretty high rate of production. But if you want the highest amount of chemical reaction done in the shortest amount of time, you have to go to the Saturn V rocket. 13 tonnes of propellant, so that's fuel and oxidizer, per second going through the five engines at the bottom of that thing. So this is the fastest chemical reactor ever built. Now, you might not think of rockets as being a chemistry-based thing, but without the chemistry, none of it happens. And space-based technology is absolutely vital to everything we do these days. So things like GPS coordinates, finding your way on a map, or getting supplies to an area affected by a flood, um, these are all enabled by space-based technologies. Satellite communications, so like ships out at sea are able to contact their home bases, or to ask for help, Again, all through satellite communications. So the science of getting a very large object into orbit is a combination of physics, engineering and chemistry. And the chemistry is really important for this. So we're going to have a look at the chemistry of rocket fuels in this lecture. So there are two parts to the chemistry of rockets. One is the oxidizer and the other is the fuel. And when we have the two of these together, they're known as propellants. So propellants have got to be pretty dense. They've got to be liquids or solids, or you can't get enough of them in the rocket to get it airborne. And when those two propellants react, they have to give out a lot of gas on reaction to give the thrust that we need to get the rocket up. Now, rocket propellants have to contain a huge amount of energy to overcome, uh, to overcome the effect of gravity on the rocket. Now, every now and again, this goes a little bit wrong and all the energy gets released at once. So you can see here, we've got a, uh, this is a Delta IV that kind of went a bit wrong on going up quite spectacularly. So it's a very high energy chemical process. So they have to be quite careful in how they work with these. So the fuel must be very energy dense, so it has a lot of energy per kilo, and it has to combust to give gaseous products which produce the thrust. So a lot of different compounds can be used for fueling rockets, the most common of which is RP1, so rocket propellant 1. And it's basically high grade kerosene or paraffin, so it's a mixture of long chain alkanes. So these are molecules with lots of carbon atoms in a row. So this is used in the Saturn V and the SpaceX Falcon 9, which is the rocket we can see here. There are a lot of other specialist fuels, though, some of which are quite interesting. So the other part of the equation is the oxidizer. Now, an oxidizer is a substance that removes electrons from a fuel and it forms bonds to fuel components. So we can get a mixture of hydrogen as a fuel and oxygen as the oxidizer. And when you put the two together, it makes water and gives out a huge amount of energy. So when you form water under very hot conditions, obviously it makes steam and that's a gas and that's a propellant. So that, that helps the, uh, with the thrust of the rocket. So you can see here we've got a, a NASA rocket motor being tested here. And this will be used on the next lot of launches for getting people into space. 
And you can see here there's a huge cloud of steam as the exhaust. Now for a compound to be a good oxidizer, it has to have components with a very strong affinity for electrons, which is what we call electronegativity. Now these tend to be elements up in the top right of the periodic table. Things like nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine and chlorine. Now the best oxidizers are usually oxygen rich species like um, liquid oxygen, hydrogen peroxide or nitric acid. You can get more exotic ones such as fluorine and chlorine trifluoride, um, but they're extremely difficult to handle and create very dangerous products, especially fluorine. Now, we can also get solid propellants. A lot of time rockets use liquids, but solids work too. Now, these are the oldest type of rockets that have been in use for about nearly 800 years. So, early Chinese rockets used gunpowder. So carbon is the fuel, and nitrates, which are nitrogen and oxygen combined, are the oxidizer. Now solid propellant rockets are often really powerful, but they're extremely hard to control once they start. So you can't shut them down, and you can't sort of lower the power if you need to. So for example, the solid rocket booster, also known as the SRB. Now this is an interesting mixture. We've got ammonium perchlorate, which... Um, Perchlorate is a chlorine with four oxygens attached, and that is the oxidizer, but the ammonium part of it is also part of the fuel. And the rest of the fuel is actually aluminium. So it, you know, they use the metal as, uh, as a rocket fuel. So if you mix aluminium and ammonium perchlorate, then you end up with lots of products. Now, some of them are gases, so we get a lot of nitrogen, we get a lot of water given off as steam, but we also get some solid mixtures here as well but the release of energy is enough to offset the fact that some of the reactants are solids. And another example is the JetX model rocket. So these are, these are model ones that sometimes you get made at schools and people who have them as hobbies and so on. And this uses what we call a monopropellant. So the oxidizer and the fuel are in the same compound. So in this case here, we've got a compound, well, an ion called guanidinium, and here is nitrate. So this has carbon and hydrogen as fuel, and it's got lots of oxygen as oxidizer. It doesn't produce a huge amount of thrust, but it's enough to get a model a few hundred meters into the air. But the real thing you really want for a big rocket is a liquid propellant. So when the propellants are liquids, you can control how they flow into the rocket motor and, and determine how much they burn and how much thrust you get and you can turn them on and off, and it's all done by pumping the liquids into the reaction area of the rocket. So with liquid fueled rockets, you can even stop them or start them in mid-flight. So it's useful for maneuvering when you're in orbit, or for changing how fast and how high you go up. Now the liquids are often cryogens. This means liquids that um, are very, very cold. So liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, that sort of thing. Um, but you could also have storable liquids that can just be left in the container without having to keep them cold. So a couple of common propellant mixtures, um, hydrogen and oxygen. It's one of the simplest chemical reactions there is, and this is what powered most of the thrust in the space shuttle and the upcoming space launch system. So in the space shuttle, this enormous orange tank is full of uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and the two of them are put together and it gives out a huge amount of energy there. So it's one of the most energetic reactions for the weight of the fuel and with that you can accelerate a shuttle up to Mach 23, so 23 times the speed of sound. And another common propellant mixture for storable rockets is um, what was used in the Titan II launch vehicle. So it's got some of the earlier astronauts into space. So this uses a mixture of nitrogen-containing compounds, such as hydrazines. We use a slightly different version of hydrazine for this one. And nitrogen tetroxide as the oxidizer. So we've got two compounds. We've got two nitrogens together. But one of them has four hydrogens, and that's fuel. And the other one has four oxygens, and that's oxidizer. And when you put them together, it gives nitrogen gas and steam. So it gives you purely gaseous components and it produces a lot of thrust. 
It's a really toxic mixture though, um, but great for getting small capsules into orbit. Now the interesting thing is, when you put the two of these together, they ignite instantly without having to set fire to them first. So this is what's known as a hypergolic mixture. It ignites spontaneously on contact. So as well as the actual chemistry of the rocket, um, also the structure of the rocket itself is also down to chemistry and engineering. So we've seen what makes the rocket go, but we also need a lot of different parts to make sure that it stays going and the structure doesn't fail. So rocket nozzles are made from an alloy called Inconel. So this is a high temperature alloy of different metals from the transition series up here. It's got a really high melting point, 1300 degrees. So it's a little bit lower than the actual working temperature of the rocket, but what they do is they pump fuel around the outside of the rocket nozzle to keep it cooler while the reaction's going on. Cool. So that's a very, very brief look at the chemistry of uh, rockets. So in summary, rocket propellants require both a fuel and an oxidizer. Propellant reactions have to release gas and a large amount of energy, or there's not enough thrust to get the rocket going. Solid propellant rockets are very powerful, but they're hard to control once they get started. Liquid propellant rockets are more controllable, but don't always have as much thrust as a solid fuel rocket. And transition metals are really important in forming specialist alloys to enable rockets to, to work in the first place. So if you want some further reading, there's a book called Ignition by John Clark. You can find it online in a lot of places, and he'll explain it in a lot more detail and in a much, much funnier way than I've just managed. Thanks for listening, everyone. Cheers.